Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 629. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. It's November 6th, 2020. All right, but before the show starts, you got to know, we have just recorded the show, but we had a few dropouts with the internet. We were not being uh, censored by Facebook. We're not being censored by YouTube. The, when we went black, it's just because the cell connection here versus the connection with George, we just went black. Everything we said, we got to say. It's just sometimes technology affects the show because we are the bleeding edge of technology. That said, here's the show. All right, welcome to another show. And yes, we're slowly approaching the number 666, as most of you have been noting in the comments, and we'll get there soon. I don't know if we'll do it in, in 2020, but uh, it would be the perfect show for 2020. It's a, been a strange year, and that strange just continues. We understand that most people watching the show right now are extremely anxious about the outcome of the election. I think we're down to the certainly the final hours of counting the ballots, and uh, then the, the, the fun begins. We shall see what happens. But uh, before we get there, you remember, uh, Kevin, they yeah. didn't decide Florida two weeks, 20 odd years ago yeah. for until December or something. Yeah, it was. And finally, the Supreme Court, the liberals in the Supreme Court said enough. So, yeah, I remember Gore uh, Bush a long, <laughs> long. That was an anxiety time for me, too. So I, I know what you're going through. I'm not incredibly anxious about this result because uh, there was a nice red wave in Congress nobody can figure out. Uh, we're certainly going to retain the Senate. Yes, there's a runoff, but the guy's too popular to lose. Um, and the judiciary is as GOP as you could imagine. Uh, right now, Nancy Pelosi could be president and you guys would still be safe. That's how, how uh, comfortable I am with all this. But uh, before we get there, you have a job as the audience, and that is to, to make George and I more popular. If you could click the like button on YouTube and Facebook, that would be great. Share us with your friends and family or anybody you think is anxious over this election. And go to the comment section. Let us know what you're thinking. Uh, George is going to give some uh, personal observations from people in his congregation and uh, neighborhood. I'll tell you what we're seeing online. And we'll just talk about you know the nature of this impressive anxiety we have right now as we see what's going to happen nobody knows uh george how's your week going pretty good uh my wife susan is out in seattle for the rest of the month she'll be back uh, after thanksgiving mm -hmm. she's caring for, for one of our daughters who was in a bicycle accident and had suffered a concussion so it's just me the dog and two cats so I'm living on tuna fish and SpaghettiOs right now. Oh, that's good. Uh, there's less shadow in your face. Did you get some lighting going on there? That's nice. Well, I moved the lighting from the chapel uh, into my office, and it's bouncing off the ceiling, so I don't look like I'm about to have a heart attack or uh, have perpetual shadow bags under my eyes. Yeah. Now, this is going to be amazing to people, but I'm recording from the same location I was the other day, and we're finally... Uh, planning far enough ahead that we can uh, book through weekends now and so uh, it, it's nice and interesting actually not to have to move the camper every three days because everybody decided during COVID hey let's go RVing and they took up all the reservations before uh, Jill and I could say all right we got the RV now what do we do well by the time we figured out what to do all the good reservations are taken now we're I think we're booked all the way through December in certain locations so uh Less stress there for us, at least, as long as we have internet. That's all I care about, George. That's all I care about. I'm um, George. Another four years, another election. Uh, the world is on edge. It's not just America watching what's going on. It's not just the, the voters, the Republicans, the Democrats in America. But every, everybody around the world is going, what, what's happening in America? How hard is it to have an election, count the ballots in a timely manner, and post the results so we know what's going on? and welcome to 2020 this is the difficulty we have and this is not the first time this has happened in an election i can think of through history classes six or seven elections that were as chaotic as this 
Yeah. One of the things I've had to do over my life is train myself to be detached from popular yeah. passions. Absolutely. My natural inclinations is to go one way and to go really hard that way. But I've always had congregations that have had a mix of people, races, classes, cultures, politics. So I never do politics from the pulpit. I Frankly, I find that offensive. And I put all of my energies, emotional energies, into caring for the people whom God has placed me among to serve. And I have seen a great deal in the last week of stress and anxiety uh, about this election. Um, and if I were to say, well, you're right or you're wrong, that doesn't do anything. But, you know, basically I try to preach that God, Jesus Christ today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow is always the same. Let's hold on. And But what I, I well, first context. I live in a county that went 71, 29 in favor of Donald Trump. And I live in a county that is primarily, it's rural, it's yeah. working, mostly working class with uh, some wealthier retirees. So it's it's a slice. I'm not on the Manhattan's Lower East Side or Connecticut's Gold Coast. I, I am where I am. Yesterday, I had to sit for three hours in the Department of Motor Vehicles. And I, I, I've learned this week, I can't wear my collar in public because if I do, I get stopped because people want to talk to me about sure. their anxiety. And I sort of wiped out by yesterday afternoon. So I'm sitting in the DMV and there are about 40, 50 people there. And usually when you go to these things, people just sit there and are glum and you know maybe look at the TV or there's one loud crank talk in the corner. What surprised me was the anger of sort of the common working man there was a young black man and you can sort of he had one of these mesh stockings or mesh stockings over his head and he was going uh, well the man is always going to win no matter what no matter what you want you know the system is fixed and there's this truck driver with a uh, baseball uh, john deere hat and a uh, you know a, a Happy jean shirt. cigar yes <laughs> no smoking government property going, you're right i drive a truck and i've been all across this country and i cannot believe they the the man the system is fixed there's a among my locale the common uh, working men and women there's a very strong sense that they have been betrayed by the elites of their country sure that uh i'm not talking now about the candidates uh I'm talking about the system, yeah. the media, yeah. the uh, the civil institutions. Um, why can we not? We can put a man on the moon. We can we can monitor spacecraft circling Mars, but in Philadelphia we can't count ballots, or in Michigan we have four thousand dead people voting. Uh, so there's there's a sense. I'll put it this way: the last president. Uh, who has had this degree of emotional attachment to people that I've been aware of is Franklin Roosevelt. Because politicians come and they go and you believe in their issue and they're sort of the standard bearer. Donald Trump, and I know some people will find this offensive, has the same connected to the to working man that Franklin Roosevelt did because there's this sense, you can say they may be misguided or not, that he understands and cares for them and is their champion. Something that the Bushes never had. Uh, Reagan was totally different. He was such an optimist that you just love to love Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, you can't compare Reagan and Trump, but no. but I think Franklin Roosevelt it, it is the last person to inspire this degree of loyalty. Maybe John F. Kennedy, I'm not sure. but uh, For the Democrat side, I would say <clears throat> certainly JFK because it was of the way he departed the earth uh, you know that, that Camelot type thing uh, was there with JFK in, in terms of you know we are a divided culture there are people who have great animosity towards uh, President Donald Trump and I've never I think that's where the division is you either really 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 hate Trump or you really 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 love Trump 
and people like you and I are kind of you, the, the middle, the, that moderate, yeah, he, I take him or leave him or whatever, is probably at the smallest percentile, even though I, I occupy that percentile um, in the history of American politics. Well, I, I really, really, really love the people in my congregation mm -hmm. who include people who despise Donald Trump and yeah. who love Donald Trump. Sure. <clears throat> um, so being an Episcopalian, uh, we probably are more liberal than the uh, uh, Presbyterian Church of America down the road. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, But where I'm going with this is that religious leaders, and I've seen people like Pat Robertson on the TV, or you mentioned Paul White. White. Sure. Um, then Archbishop Figano, mm -hmm. uh, the Roman Catholic Archbishop who has been played such a prominent role in uncovering abuse, talking about the demonic in this election and I frankly am very uncomfortable with that because I believe in the demonic I believe it's true but to cast such a wide net uh, only well this makes is, it makes the divide bitter this is kind of where I find the folly in all of this is I've watched the evangelicals pray for their will I've watched the evangelicals pray for the nation's will and for uh, the Constitution's will, I don't see them praying for God's will. God, what is your will for this nation? They assume what this will is, you know, for this nation. Um, but I, I see a lot of folly in that when I see all these evangelicals stand up and say, God told me President Trump will be reelected. I'm like, whoa, yeah. Uh, you better be right. Otherwise, otherwise you are a false prophet. You know, uh, no, well, they just weren't listening closely. He meant <laughs> 2024. 2024. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, see, well, I don't want to be too hard on uh, those whom they believe God has spoken to, because sure. certainly I've had feelings at times in my life where I'm devoutly convinced, and I want so much it to be right, it must be God's will. So I, I've made that mistake many, many times. Mm -hmm. Then we have the other side, I sort of epitomized by the mainline churches who uh, are relentlessly cheerleading uh, you know, I'm sure in uh, the coming days we'll see little pieces in the New York Times by the uh, uh, you remember the uh, the former dean of the Episcopal Seminary in Bo Boston who talked about uh, abortion, abortion being a, blessing. a sacrament a blessing, and a blessing yeah. and we'll, we'll get those people out who tell us that you know it is part of the arc of history that we're moving forward with full inclusion, full murder of children, full this and that. Um, what it really comes down to is that the church as an institution has spent the last 60 years abdicating its responsibilities to civic civil groups such that when the Episcopal Church talks on an issue of moral standing, doesn't mean anything. I mean, they talk more about mosquito nets uh, than they do about salvation in Jesus Christ alone. And I, you make a really good point that for 20, 25 years now, public schools have been just making social justice warriors, and the church got jealous. Well, we can do that. We can make social justice warriors. We'll just make them more holy. And we're just, we're bewildered by an ineffective church and an ineffective public education system. And we're just, we're mirrored in a lack of uh, catechesis in the church and uh, civil education in, in the schools. You know, and here we are. And quality of clergy. Yeah. Uh, many, many, many priests and ministers lack the confidence in the gospel. Mm -hmm. They seek the acclaim of the world. They seek uh, they seek power and authority, not understanding that all power and authority derives from God, God our Father. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they seek to exercise. Uh, well, I can't tell you how many pre frustrated priests I've met who basically have chosen the wrong profession because they do not seek to be servants of all they seek to tell the servants what to do, yeah. what to think, what to believe, rather than to be an agent of God's love and will and to, trans and to build the kingdom of God one person at a time. 
and when you do that, um, well, let's just take this this time. Uh, how do we des how do we des def uh, how do we see God's will, God's glory, in these turbulent times? Do we go to the streets or do we get on our knees in prayer? Uh, I the think only, I know which way to go. Yeah, the only way a Christian can riot is on its knees. That's the only way you can riot. You, you, you uh, take the, the 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 gates of heaven and you you cry holy, holy, holy. Uh, any other thing is just you standing on a street looking silly. Um, no, th there's civil protests mm -hmm. and stuff which are fine, but there's no way you can riot. That's that's silly. No, uh, pl please don't hear me to be saying that we should just be meek and mild no. and just roll over and take it. Rather, I think. I'm speaking first first off to the clergy our role is not to be instigators mm -hmm. but to be prayer warriors and to be there for our people and help them through these times um, of fear and anger and panic and a sense of uh, betrayal that's I think that's the thing that I really am sort of picking up in my rounds and at the DMV a sense of betrayal you can't trust television news. The people at the DMV debating whether or not Fox News was correct in calling Arizona. Oh, sure. Yeah. While the, the vote was out, and then being consistently negative uh, about President Trump, and with the response as well, I'm never going to watch them again. They've betrayed me. And there's. I don't know if there's. I, I assume there's voter fraud because there's. Always going to be voter fraud in Philadelphia. I mean, I mean, come on now. In Chicago. Uh, hey, but, when, you know, vote off and vote early. Uh, I mean, when the headlines the were... the betrayal yeah. that it's also, you know, what I've ex when I was in the hospice priest, mm -hmm. uh, I experienced that sense of betrayal from many, many people, but the betrayal was by the church. Uh, yeah. People where the church had left them, the church was not there for them, but, or the minister abused them or the minister made them feel dirty or unclean or <sighs> I think we need a time of repentance um, not for the other person's sins no <laughs> but for ours yeah, and I think you you made a really good point is people feel betrayed because nobody is there for them mm -hmm. when you were the hospice priest you were there for them and the people at the DMV, the people who are looking and say, there's no news outlet that represents me. There's no government official except for Trump and his supporters who represent me. That was kind of the, that was my team. And I mm -hmm. knew that uh, Trump was an outsider because I'm an outsider. And now there's just nobody to protect my, to give me the news I need uh, to, to know what's going on. There's just no unbiased. Yeah, and the, there's the, truth to that. The elite hate Donald Trump, but they also hate me for working with my hands. Yeah. They, they hate me for not uh, aspiring to what they aspire to. They hate me because they don't, I don't believe the way they do. Mm -hmm. And they hate Donald Trump. And so Donald Trump, for some people, have gained he's gained a mythic now i don't want to debate donald trump's merits or personal <laughs> no. behavior i don't care about that no all right welcome back <laughs> so we don't want to debate donald trump or the, the merits you said correct and well i was going to go on an on an, on a uh, a tear uh on that point which was what i said i didn't want to do sure but I, I just come back to this great sense of being unsettled and uneasy. And I, to be frank, I don't think if, if the election went the other way, Trump supporters would be any, they may be short term happier, but that sense of alienation, this is a, this, the, the events of this past week are a capstone to their life experiences of alienation. Sure. Um, we now live in a country where it, where Hispanic and African American women, young women, are more likely to go to, go to college than to white men of a similar age group. Mm -hmm. Yet white men are demonized by the cultural elites of our society for putting down 
the uh, f for being you know the patriarchy is responsible for all social ills. Well, the average lived experience of an American is that that's utter complete nonsense. <laughs> Yet that's what we're being force fed in our education, in mm -hmm. our media, by our churches. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, you know, the Episcopal Church has set aside for women's and minorities and this and that, and uh, they, the net result is to make the church distinctly lacking in testosterone. The church is now, it's, for a long time it's been getting this way, but the, net, the, the sort of person who rises to top of leadership usually are lacking, are, are feminized men. Uh, rather than the sort of traditional leader that we've always uh, culturally expected. Uh, I'm stepping on wires that. here, no, no, but stepping on I, live wires here, but you know the... But, the, but that's just yeah. it. I mean, we, we've <clears throat> really flopped our culture. And it's not just here in America, uh, clearly, but um, what worked in the past is not allowed to work anymore. What Part failed in the past is allowed to fail now. Part of the deep anger that I witnessed against someone like Jack Eicher and Bob Duncan mm -hmm. in the deliberations of the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church is that they were very masculine men. Still and are. they still are. Uh, but their masculinity was a strike against them in a feminized culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Frank Griswolds and the vast majority I was going to mention bishops. Frank Griswold when you said lightly on your feet <laughs> so. and I'm not talking about the gay issue now I'm just talking about the the cultural presentation and cultural motifs and norms um, that culture has been taken from the working class and told it's wrong and nothing has been given back to it other than the corrupted uh, uh, venal pop uh, thing that passes for pop culture today. Now, if you are a white male, <clears throat> you are Archie Bunker. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just that's just a given. You you are part of the problem. Uh, your whiteness, the way you, you were raised to be white, uh, you were you know you you were raised to be Archie Bunker and treat everybody else like Edith, and. It, I just no, it doesn't work but, that way. But I, one of the watch one of the little tidbits I picked up in the news coverage, and I have to say it, this, that Donald Trump increased his margins among every group in society, uh, except for white Native Americans. <laughs> just like, <laughs> he, Blacks, he ruled. His, you know, just Black, like, oh my gosh. <clears throat> Blacks, Hispanic. Uh, you know, Donald Trump's uh, portion of the minority vote has been the highest of any Republican since, uh, I think, uh, in 60 years. So that uh, this lie that is this cultural diversity, uh, that the pursuit of diversity, which I believe is an utter fiasco and hoax, is starting to fall apart uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the people are just not buying it. They haven't bought it, but it's now spreading so that those who are ostensibly to be advantaged of it find, hey, you know, this isn't real. This isn't working. I'm not one of the favored few or the elites. So we live in a culture now where news anchors can call Clarence Thomas and Uncle Tom. Uh, but then if you voted again, but if you, but if you voted for uh, Donald Trump, you're a virulent racist. You have the same news anchor saying that. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, Donald Trump has made America a safer place as far as uh, at the machine level. You know, w when you get to the machine level, the, the government level, it is a safer place for people like me, like George. Uh, he's overturn the CRT teaching that was uh, being done in uh, government offices around the, the country. He's overturned uh, a, a lot of things by executive order that can be undone by Biden easily. But 
he has made it a safer place just in four years of replacing the liberal judiciary. Um, he, you know, that's going to take a long time uh, for the liberals to gut and replace the uh, ninth S district S court out of San Francisco. That's sorry, that's ours now. Yay! Um, I don't, you know, if Donald Trump uh, loses his election and steps down i think it's a great opportunity for uh, another conservative to step forward in four years um if he, he gets a recount and is put back in office uh so be another you know a great outcome i don't see in, in my humble opinion people overwhelmed and say we want biden yeah all right i think a lot of people went to the polls and said yep republican congress republican senate and they just had that trouble pulling the, the Trump ticket, you know, and that's but just I, my humble opinion. Well, I don't, but I, if Biden is successful in the election, my, my one guess as to future is all of a sudden we'll have the news media start saying the uh, coronavirus <laughs> is just a bad flu. You would be surprised how that switches, yes. And that uh, all of a sudden that the new Biden plan which is the old Trump plan, mm -hmm. is cause the pandemic to cease. And in yeah. other words, the, we'll go from black is black to black is white, and white is white to white is black. Uh, no matter what, we're going to make a lot of money in the in the stock exchange, uh, no matter who is president, because the, the Wall Street likes uh, to just to have an answer. They don't really care who the president is. Um, you know, th this is politics. Uh, there's a reason Christians don't need to sit down and watch politics all the time. Your politics are in Christ, not in uh, elephants or donkeys. What are they uh, think, thinking of politics? The, the bishops of the Church of England now seem to be individually speaking out against these lockdown yeah. laws. Uh, so good for them, but I wonder is it it's always it's it's a shallow thing to say too little too late because you don't not know in where england they... uh, in england it's a little different i think when they you know finally speak people are like who are they oh they're the bishops let's listen and see what they have to say i mean it, uh, this is kind of the english culture in itself when, when it's bad enough that they finally speak well we better listen so well here's the thing that the bishops were very active in opposing Brexit and were very active on some party political issues. And now in this fight over uh, that the government is shutting down the country, I don't know all the details, but my impression is that this is an overreach. Yeah. The bishops are now atomized and you have individual bishops speaking out to their local newspapers but they're not speaking with any degree of moral authority. And as you say, Kevin, it's because who are they? Yeah. They've wasted it all. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you are being faithful to thou shalt not be anxious. <laughs> it's in the Bible, uh, even though I feel a bit anxiety, so you can feel a bit too, it's okay. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 628? 29. I'll go with 29. 29. That's right. 629 of Anglican Unscripted.